Welcome to Rock Shop Talk. Our show talks best practices, fun anecdotes, and the latest cutting-edge technology in our field to kick your screen printing gears into hyperdrive. Today's episode features the topic of the buck starts here and service, general tips, FIR requests, and technical advice for the screen printers. And we're joined by our special guest, me, tech team leader, Buck Primo, and APG director, Mark Showman. The Rock US tour bus is actually almost ready for our first tour. We'll be refraining from beginning the tour until it's actually safe to travel for the long term. To follow the tour and even reserve a visit when we come through your town, follow hashtag Rock US tour on social media. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be right back. All right, so I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk. Today's episode features a topic of the buck starts here and service, general tips, maintenance repair requests, also known as FIRs, technical advice for screen printers. We are joined by our special guest, tech team leader, Buck Primo, and our APG director, Mr. Mark Showman of Rock US. I am Rock US President Ross Hunter and general manager alongside of my creative producer, Mr. Merrill Caps. What's up? So awesome. So we're going to dive in today um, and talk to all of you rockers and future rockers out there looking to get a press about what happens when things that we don't want to have happen happen, which are going to happen, you know, maintenance, repairs, service, etc. Um, and we're going to kind of get that started with how do customers let us know that there is a problem with their press and that they need help um, repairing it. So I'll send that over to Mark or Buck. Well, go ahead, Buck. Uh, Well, there's a a number of different ways that we're doing it. Um, One, you can call direct into the Rock support line, 187 Rocket Now. Um, You can also go to rock.us. And there is a support link there that you can fill out a request ticket and try to fill out as much information as possible, kind of what's going on. And that's going to ping all of the technicians, everybody in our ROC team to be able to respond at the quickest possibility. Um, And then between those two, um, you can, well, I guess call in, but those are the, the two main ones that you can do. I mean, you can submit that support ticket from your phone while you're at the press, take photos, take video. So when we do call you guys, which it should be very quick after you guys submit that ticket, that we can respond with, uh, you know, all that information that you've provided. So we can uh, solve it really quick. Awesome. And I know um, a lot of times it's simple, right? I mean, you might be able to solve it over the phone. Sometimes we need, you know, parts ordered and different stuff. So, um, on that first call, you know, can you kind of explain to the audience sort of what do we do internally? How are we tracking these things? If they don't get a call back within what amount of time, when should they reach back out? Um, yeah, you guys absolutely. want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So, so the tickets going out, um, and, we're getting it rather quickly and then it it resubmits every two hours. Now, Buck or the team will call out um, immediately when they get it, if they are not on another uh, ticket. And so it's really important. I mean, the important thing is they do a lot of calling throughout the day and nobody, a lot of times nobody's picking up their phones. So they're getting a lot of voicemail and we understand people have businesses to run at the same time. So we're cognizant of that and we'll return the phone call, but you most likely will not recognize the phone number. Uh, it's probably calling from 303 Colorado or it's gonna come from Florida or even the Northwest. So it's just important if you do submit that, if you don't recognize the phone number, do answer it because uh, it's probably the tech on the other end. Absolutely. And I know for a long time, at least for the last seven years, we've called uh, our our support tickets FIRs, um, which technically means field incident report. Um, We we are changing that. And you guys are our audience out there. Those of you that already own rocks will will start to see repair uh, ticket. I mean, it's just a repair request. Um, We've changed the nomenclature online to make it uh, a lot simpler for those just joining our rock family. 
um, that don't understand uh, military acronyms um, that actually are are kind of not make a whole lot of sense. I know when I started here, I was confused by them. So we are going to make it more simple. The website's a good place. And um, I know that we're working on some uh, QR codes as well. Meryl, do you want to kind of speak a little bit about what we're doing from, I, I want to call it a marketing standpoint, but just to help our, our customers with, sorry, partners mm -hmm. with uh, their FIR um, or repair ticket requests? Well, my understanding is that those, those QR codes will bring you directly to a unique page to serve your specific issue. So we can know exactly how to handle that immediately. All right, so it'll be a simple sticker. Everyone will be able to put on their press. Uh, you take your cell phone out, smartphone out, hover your camera over it, and it'll auto direct you straight to um, a repair ticket. So essentially you can really be at the press and not even have to type in a URL and navigate a website. It'll just be right there in front of you. So that'll be really, really convenient yeah, for absolutely. everyone. Absolutely, For sure. Will, will my flip phone camera work for that? Um, I don't think so, Buck. Depends on what kind of flip phone. If we're talking about the new <laughs> Razor, then probably. Yeah, one of the. I understand the question given the glasses that you're wearing right now. So <laughs> makes total sense. We got some nice '80s going on. So Ooh, Buck's yeah. talking about his Motorola flip phone that I he like that. owned at one point in time in his life. Um, so when is it appropriate for uh, our, our partners to submit an FIR? I mean, what what constitutes that? Really, anything. Um, if they hear a weird noise or if they've just got a general question as far as flood settings or flash settings or it's anything. So that's kind of why we we made it uh, the FIR, Field Incident Report, versus a repair ticket. Repair ticket just means that something's broke. With Field Incident Report, it could just be they need help with their passwords, help with maintenance, help with just anything general rock-related. So that's why it all kind of encompassed that, that FIR. So with a repair ticket, it's still going to be the same thing. So anytime that they have questions, um, shop moves, anything like that that is related to their equipment, they can call in, put in a ticket, we'll call out and figure out what's going on and how to best uh, fix the issue. Absolutely. And and the sooner the better. Uh, as soon as, like Buck's saying, as soon as you hear a noise, as soon as you'll learn your press, as soon as just seeing something's weird, feel free to reach out. Um, we're dealing with a dryer uh, right now that um, they heard things and they waited, little things, and they waited months and months and months. And, and then they call us their dryers down and they got a lot of cleaning to do. So we don't want to reach that point. We can diagnose things really early in the process. You'll be up and running and it's not going to have a press go down. So yeah. water dryer. Don't wait for you to have 10 issues and then us resolve all 10 of them at the same time. Every time you have an issue, let's fill out a form. We'll be able to get parts there or whatever is needed to fix that rather than waiting till, you know, the house is on fire. And now we need to, you know, fix a bunch of stuff versus just one little thing at a time. Plus it keeps track of a history of your machine. So if you are having, uh, say, two years ago, you had the same issue, we can see if there's a trend and if maybe there's something else, even though we're throwing this part at it, it might be a completely different part that will fix the, the main issue rather than, you know, putting that bandaid on it. Absolutely. And that actually goes back. You brought up a good point. It gives us a record of your equipment. And so that's why it's important to submit the ticket as opposed to getting the text phone number or calling Buck or whatnot, because they're moving on from one call to the next, or even uh, your tech that set up the machine is at a different install. Um, so they're not, they're busy. They can't answer the phone. So you're wait hanging. So if you do um, have an issue, it is really important if you submit that ticket and not go directly to the tech and uh, you will be serviced a lot quicker and a lot cleaner. Absolutely. And I, I think another important point for our viewers out there is those tickets are our internal accountability system. And, you know, I mean, obviously in business, we have problems, we have customers that, that get upset sometimes, things happen. And I do know that, you know, in my history here, when people reach out directly to tax, it doesn't get logged, 
maybe that phone call doesn't get returned or something happens. And without that ticket, it's really hard to understand where our breakdown is and what we need to do better as a company. And, you know, we're definitely not perfect. We're, we're, we're working, you know, diligently to get more techs out in the field to, you know, respond to issues quicker. We're actually updating a lot of our system um, to automate um, more of our process in terms of our like field software, um, which helps us better track um, incidents, better track our, our text travel time. I mean, all sorts of different things it's going to do for us. But without having that information, it's, it is really difficult as a company when someone does call into that number, finally, the 800 number that, that Buck gave out. And they're like, hey, no one's gotten back to me in two weeks. If there's nothing in our system, it's really hard to understand where that breakdown was. And so, um, you know, I do ask that, that all of our rock owners out there and future rock owners definitely take that extra, you know, two, three minutes to fill out the form because it is what makes us better as well. Um, it may be slightly inconvenient than just pressing a button on your phone and hitting send and dialing a number, but you'd be doing us a big service, um, by filling out those forms Absolutely. too. So yeah. wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, uh, Mark, going back to what you were saying, can you, can you talk about more about the intervals at which rock owners should schedule maintenance services? And, uh, in addition to that, any red flags that people should look for before scheduling? Yeah, I'm going to throw that to Buck. Buck did uh, some really good uh, videos a while back on that exact topic. Yeah, we. if you just search on YouTube or, or, or Google, just search rock maintenance, you'll see all the videos. It gives you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to do your general maintenance. This is when your little maintenance guy comes up on your screen with the wrench saying that you need to do your maintenance. Um and it shows you where to go to find out what type of maintenance you need to do because it's in, at different intervals. But if you search on YouTube, uh, just type in rock maintenance, we have videos for the general maintenance on um, how to perform that and how to reset your maintenance guy. There's a log that it tells me um, your previous history, when you were warned, um, at how many indexes you were warned and when you actually perform the maintenance. So I can see how long you went between when you were warned and when you actually executed. So it's not necessarily to say, hey, now you guys don't have a, a warranty anymore. It's just to kind of tell me you guys are getting the, uh, the warning, but you're not doing maintenance until the next 50,000 cycles. So there's something mm -hmm. on there. It's mm -hmm. really easy. Rock maintenance is very simple to do. Uh, it comes with the press comes, the dryer comes with everything you need to do in order to perform that maintenance. So it's a no brainer. Um, if you guys do have questions, you can submit an FIR for a repair request and we can send you the link or whatever you have uh, questions about. And then other than maintenance, we also have step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix certain issues that we can also send you if, uh, if you need that. So we've got a lot of really good documentation on how to help you guys out uh, a lot quicker. Absolutely. And the vision part of that whole thing is creating another QR code. Hmm. So you can actually scan that and hit right into all our rock videos. So you can find the, the video that's best uh, suiting what you need to have done. So that's coming up as well in the future. But yeah, absolutely. And Buck, how do you, we get a lot of calls too on, on that little guy comes up. I did my maintenance and how do I get rid of him? Yeah. So in the videos at that very end, I, explain how to reset it so it, it's step by step where you need to go but it's it's pretty easy you go to utilities detectors log reset and then the, the username will be technico password is one through nine one two three four five six seven eight nine you'll hit okay it'll say login successful you hit reset one more time you'll see the reset button go away and the maintenance guide is going to go away. So it is really easy. And there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. Awesome. And I, I'd just like to point out, I'm just going to have weird chime-ins through this whole thing to, to our listeners. But, you know, most of these presses cost more than your car, um, you know, and they need some love, just like your car needs some love every, you know, couple thousand miles, you do an oil change, you're in diesel, at least every 10,000 miles, you know, you let that stuff go. And you've got, you know, a 20, 30, 40, 50, $60,000 problem on your hand. 
you know, with your vehicle and your, your press doesn't even need as much maintenance as your car does. I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, pretty spaced out when you have to do these things. But when, when your check engine light comes on in your car, you definitely take it in to get service. Maybe you don't, but, um, but you know, most folks do. So the idea is the same with your press. When the maintenance guy comes up, you know, take the time, you know, it doesn't take long, take care of it because, you know, you don't want to let those things drag on for a long time. It's just going to lead uh, to more and more, you know, issues. So I just think it's kind of important to have that sort of analogy in there. Um, cause it's hard when you're running a shop and oh, you know, you're like, I don't have time for this or, or whatever the case may be, but just remember that that tool is what keeps your business running. And if that tool's down, um, you're going to be losing money instead of taking the, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to, to perform maintenance. And, you know, on that note too, we're in a very dirty industry. Um, I know when I moved to the Pacific Northwest out of LA, I'm realizing now that my car needs to be washed way more uh, than when I lived in California, just because of all the rain and all the stuff going on. Well, you know, screen printers use a lot of glue. There's a lot of cotton floating around. There's ink, there's all this stuff. And just like your vehicle that, you know, you try to keep clean. So your paint stays in good condition and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's important not only to perform this routine maintenance, but make sure, you know, your interval cleaning your machine because that glue, the cotton, the ink, everything, it builds up and that buildup can start to cause problems with your, you know, pallet locking mechanisms and, you know, other things as well. So it, it kind of goes beyond just, you know, the maintenance your press tells you to do, you know, tr treat it like you would your vehicle that you really care about. And um, it'll stay in great shape for years and years and years and years. Yeah, that's a great point. And we're finding, you know, that clean shops are shops that don't give us a call because their press and their equipment is just running awesome. And I know from being a former shop owner, that Friday cleanup day, when that press is not revolving uh, and you're not making money, it's hard to look at it. You see all your employees washing away and, and trying to see, hey, is that really paying back? Honestly, I can tell you by cleaning up your equipment, maintaining that is it's gonna pay off dividends in the long run. Absolutely. It's good insight. We did have a quick question that came in uh, to be asked. On average, when is the first time a press would expect to need maintenance? 50,000. 50,000. Okay. Yep. Thank you very um, much. And, and that is that is for the U um, on the Ecos and Max machines, ovals, that's going to be at 100,000. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Awesome. We'll take a quick uh, commercial break and we will be right back with more maintenance tips from our team. This into a rock, you become a family member and we will treat you as such. For the best and soonest response to your service request, submit a field incident report or FIR at rock.us. Go to the support tab, scroll down to repair request parentheses FIR. Instead of reaching out to an individual tech or salesperson, this way we'll have documentation and accountability from the start. For the best in service, please visit rock.us, that's R-O-Q dot U-S, or call 1-877-ROCK-IT-NOW. That's 1-877-674-8669. Want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we talk everything screen printing. Today's episode features the buck starts here and service general tips, FIR requests, and special advice for screen printers. We're joined by our special guest tech team leader, Buck Primo, and APG director, Mr. Mark Showman of Rock US. So we're going to dive back into uh, some more questions. Uh, first one here is, how is the Rock US tech team handling service during COVID-19? And what precautions are being taken while we're out there, you know, helping people make repairs as well as doing new installs? Well, I'll, I'll take this. I've been out to California a couple of times and California, I'd say, is probably the most strict as far as everything that's going on. Um, you know, we're, we're wearing masks if, if it's required in that state or even if the shop wants it, um, you know, clean washing hands. Um, some techs have hand sanitizer when they go out. So. Um, we are taking the same precautions that I think everybody else is taking. 
Um, you know, obviously we have to fly to some of these locations, aircraft, definitely not the best place, but most of those uh, airlines, they require you to wear a mask. So we're coming in, we know that we're healthy. Um, I've been tested, came back negative, so that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, if the, the shop wants, you know, six feet of separation or mass or whatever, we're willing to do whatever we need to do in order to serve the customer. Awesome. And has that affected our, you know, ability to travel and get places and. Oh, early on. Yeah. It's affected quite a bit, especially um, we had a tech in St. Louis and had to get back to New Hampshire and had to drive through. So I was really nervous about going through states just because some states require a 14 day quarantine, um, especially when they see out of state plates and whatnot. So um, nervousness, we were down to two techs traveling at one time where others um, just didn't feel comfortable going out and, and we were okay with that. Uh, beauty of it, they were able to service what we needed to. Places are opening up a lot more. We have a full tech team now um, traveling and and working with that. And then like Buck said, uh, they're all masked up. And if you have different requirements at your shop, obviously let them know on their pre-call and don't be afraid to say it. And uh, they certainly uh, will honor that. And if during, during the visit, when they're doing the install or the repair uh, and they're not following protocol, uh, feel free to talk to them as well. Um, it's not on purpose. There's just habits, new habits that we're all trying to create. So, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, what is the best way to maximize the longevity of the life of an auto press? Well, I would say that the number one thing is your air. Okay, it's not part of your routine maintenance. Your little maintenance guy is not going to come up and tell you to check your chiller, but. Uh, time and time again, I go into a shop, they're saying that they're having issues with uh, air components. And then I check on the main air regulator, there's a trap on the bottom. There's a screw that you can loosen and any moisture that is collected will collect in that cup. And I've seen, um, you know, over a cup of water that has come out of this trap. And what that tells me is that the chiller is not doing its job. Or if it is, maybe they've got valves that are shut and it's bypassing the chiller. Um, whatever's happening, you're getting moisture into your machine. Once that happens, your warranty for pneumatic parts is now void, which is not good for you. Um, it's going to be a recurring issue. This component's going to go out over time and then the next component and the next component. So it's going to save you a lot of money by making sure that you have clean, dry air and what you can do is on a weekly basis, just check that trap and make sure that your chiller is working. If it's not, call the company that you bought it from and have them come out and take a look at it to make sure that it, it is functioning the way that it should. Do not buy a Harbor Freight chiller. That will not work for you. We know this because we have customers that have bought them. They went through six in a matter of a year and it ruined some of the components. So Make sure you're, you're buying a, a good chiller. I always tell customers, skimp on your compressor, but your chiller needs to be the best chiller that you can, you can purchase at that time. And some good brands out there, I mean, that I know of are like Ingersoll Rand, Curtis. Yeah. Um, those are probably like the two more industrial. Yeah, Quincy is another good brand. I mean, it, spend some money on it. it. It should cost you around, you know, $800 to $2,000 for a proper chiller. There are some of the, the uh, lower end ones that work perfect, but, you know, some of these Ingersoll Rands, you can set it up to where uh, you want it to purge um, every 30 minutes for two seconds, and it's going to make sure that there's no moisture so, I mean, there's, there's a number of really good chillers out there. Just make sure that you have one and you're checking that trap on a, a, a weekly basis to, to make sure that it is doing its job. Because otherwise, you're just going to run into issues from that day forward. I think it's important, too, for people to check their, their air tanks. I know oh, I sure. ran a, uh, a rotary screw, a very large rotary screw compressor uh, back when I had my shop. We had a separate air tank. And so basically the compressor generated the air, it went to the holding tank, then it went over to the chiller and then out to the presses. 
And that, that holding tank that was meant to hold air, I remember one time, you know, we hadn't checked it and I probably drained 50 gallons of water out of that thing. Now, what's nice is it never hit my press. My chiller was doing a good job, but the chiller was having to work overtime because there was so much air sitting in that holding tank. So, you know, for those of you guys, I mean, everyone's got a compressor. There is a place to drain liquid out of your compressor as well. And I definitely recommend that folks do that, you know, probably once a week. I mean, depending on how busy you are, but it's important because there will always be, you know, condensation water that sits in that holding tank. Yeah. yeah. Before you of, leave on Fridays, you know, yeah. take um, a lot break. of customers, what they'll, they think that the chiller is removing all the moisture from uh, the compress the, the compressor system. Right. But what it is, is you've got your compressor and then after your compressor, your tank, that's when it goes to the chiller and then from the chiller to your equipment. So all of that moisture that is gathered from the air outside into that tank will sit at the bottom of your tank. Yep. Normally there's a trap that you can open and drain all that out. Uh, some compressor companies actually have an automatic drain, which I highly recommend. So then it's a no brainer. You know that it's being drained, but to have, you know, 35 gallons of water, which I've been to a customer and I got 35 gallons of water out of a 40 gallon tank. That's just a ticking time bomb that that tank could explode. Yep. So it is very, very important to check both of those, you know, that you're, you're constantly draining your tank, whether if you're in a, a high humid climate, you need to make sure that you're doing it on a weekly basis. If you're in say Texas or California where it's dry, Maybe you only have to do it once a month, but you need to be checking this. Absolutely. Are there any other uh, examples? I mean, this is a great one for, for chillers and air, but. Yeah, I would say, you know, your pallet locking mechanisms. This is something that um, we've, we've come up with a new design that seems to be helpful, but even then it's still your, your blade that comes over and locks your pallet in is still exposed. So if you're using spray tack and web spray, you're over spraying. I'm, you know, I'll go to shops and they're holding the can way above the pallet. It's like you, you don't need to be that high because it's getting all over the press. It's getting over all over everything. So um, that blade is still exposed, no matter if you've got the old style or the new style. I would highly recommend covering this with either tape or magnets or something, so you're preventing that spray tack from getting on the blades. But doing say a weekly where you're cleaning it with Goo Gone. And then I would say, you know, spraying some lube WD-40 or VDM-18, VT-800, any sort of lube is going to help you um, with the longevity of that locking device. It's awesome. Very yeah. Yeah. I want to chime in too on the, on the glue thing. And, and this is kind of a different sort of topic than repair and maintenance. But, um, you know, once you break into the auto world, the only spray adhesive you should ever really be using is web tack for fleece. I mean, if those of you listening are still using mist adhesive and you're printing six, 700 shirts an hour, you are losing a lot of money in glue. I used to teach a, a whole class at the trade show. It's called do more with less and screen printing. And it's the number one thing I tell people they're losing money on it's actually adhesive because a liquid pallet adhesive is, I don't know what, 15 bucks a gallon. You can dilute it one to one with water. You know, one application will probably get you through a hundred to 150 units. Um, you know, multicolor printing compared to spraying tack every single time you pull a garment off the press and put another one on at, you know, what's a can of glue these days, five, six bucks. Oh, right. So, you know, for those of you listening, if you are still using spray mist and you've never used liquid pallet adhesive, I highly recommend it, not just to, to, to save on what Buck's talking about, you know, your pallet locking mechanisms, you're going to save on cleanup, you are going to save your lungs. I mean, there's so many pieces to that to get away from, from spray tack. And I know for, for a lot of people, and I, I will include myself as, as an offender of this years ago, um, it was just easy. You know, I didn't have the extra step of heating up the glue and, you know, warming up the press, but you know, once you learn, you actually have to do those things anyway, 
um, you know, it, it made the switch really simple. So really big tip out there for those of you listening. If you haven't tried it, make sure you pick up some some water-based liquid palette adhesive. Yeah. The other cool thing about that water-based adhesive is once it starts getting to where it's no longer holding the garment down, it's not tacky anymore, you can use a spray bottle, spray water onto uh, the palette and use the screen, uh, screen cleaner that you're using to clean the emulsion and everything off. Use that same brush and you can brush all of the lint off and all of it will come off. It's amazing. And then reflash it and it's like it's brand new. It's amazing. So if you wow. keep doing that, now you're not going through palette tape as much. You're not going through as much glue. And you can keep doing this until it loses it completely. But uh, what I try to recommend, because it doesn't work as well, once you have that lint on your palette, if you reapply the, the glue, you can no longer do that whole scrub trick. But you save so much money on not having to uh, reapply a palette tape, which takes a long time, depending on how skilled the person is. Um, it, you know, adhesive, all of that stuff. It, it's, it's going to save you money and time. Awesome. Awesome. Great tips. Yeah. I think too, is, you know, we're concentrating on the press as well, but we get calls on flash care units. Uh, Buck, you want to touch on kind of the hot spots there to clean, make sure they're cleaning the flash care units. Yeah. As well as their dryers. You guys probably saw that the tech tip that I just recorded maybe a couple of weeks ago, but it was cleaning your fan covers. You got fan covers that are metal mesh and Lint will get in this, adhesive will get in this, depending on if you're using the spray adhesive. And what that's doing is it's clogging that cover and you're not pulling as much air through the flash onto the garment and your bulbs are getting hotter, the whole hood's getting hotter. On the Evolution flashes, you'll actually um, overheat the flash because of this. So I would say same thing Friday or Monday, whatever day you guys do your, your general cleanup, pull these fan covers off, go back and watch that video. It'll show you, all I did was pressure wash them. Once I'm done pressure washing them, let them sit out and dry and then you just put them back on. So it's very easy to do and that's gonna prolong all of your electronic components that are in your flash, everything. It, and you're, you're gonna cure faster because of pulling more air and pushing it onto the garment. Awesome, and then anything specific with tunnels? Tunnels, I mean, you've got a couple filters that you need to keep an eye on. Um, one is your burner filter. I get a lot of phone calls for customers saying that the, the dryer, the, the burner's not firing anymore. And the first thing that I check is the filter. I've pulled off uh, enough lint off one dryer filter that I could have made, you know, a, a hat. And it's, it's so crazy that people aren't checking that. But the reason is, is it's underneath the dryer. You know, you're, you're so busy on printing and just staying focused on making money but you're not looking underneath the dryer. So looking at this filter maybe once a week, um, it should look maybe discolored white. So it's got a little bit of lint on it, but if if you can see that it it's covered in lint, you're not getting the right um, air fuel ratio and your burner's not gonna work correctly. So you need to keep an eye on that filter. It's very easy to uh, pull off. We have a video that shows step-by-step -step how you need to do that. The other filter that you need to keep an eye on is your burner filter. Normally this isn't as much, maybe once a month, depending on how often you guys are printing, but pull that out. There's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that as well. Uh, pull that out, you can pressure wash it, let it dry in the sun, and then throw it back in. But those are the two major ones, but the burner filter is, I would say the top one because that is gonna make your dryer to where it's not functioning anymore. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. So I wanted to kind of put ourselves on the chopping block for a minute and um, wanted to see if you guys could share an example of a service call that we did, um, maybe an install, maybe both, um, that didn't go well and what we learned and what could have been done differently. We're in one right now. And um it's a it's a used piece of equipment, and so kind of can tend to fall into to traps there with the used piece of equipment, being it with not setting the expectations correctly on how it's going to look when it arrives. To you know, our tech's going to be on site. A is going to clean it, but B, 
you know, if there's anything wrong, we will fix it uh, and we'll make sure that we'll get that up and running. So we're in one right now where a folder machine went out and we added another part to it and we weren't able to refurb it correctly, uh, which leads me to the point is we are working on a place facility to be able to do that. So when we do have pre-owned equipment, they will come um, already checked out. But this piece wasn't, it sat for a while. And, um, and then we just didn't do a good enough job communicating with our customer. And it tends to be that's generally where we fall flat um, is communication. And, you know, when conflict is hard sometimes and it's hard to people to reach out and to, to communicate that. And, and I feel we're, we're learning that. We're doing a better job. We're trying to head things off before things happen um, and communicate along the way. I know as a shop owner, yeah, I'd be upset, but at least I knew what I was dealing with. And, and then we could go through and, and do that. So this particular customer... Um, wasn't feeling like he was getting communicated with correctly, needed something, this piece for a piece of equipment for a deadline. And, um, you know, I reached out to him. We had a good conversation. Uh, we've got a tech going out in a week. I just spoke with him today and he's got parts on site. And as long as we're communicating, he's got a complete understanding of what we need to do. And I really believe that most of our stuff comes down to communication and, um, and just expectations. And once we do that, um, things are good, but we have to get better at that realm, setting expectations and communicating better. Awesome. And then in terms of like a, a brand new, you know, screen printer into this industry or someone upgrading from, let's say, manual press to an auto um, what are some things that we could communicate to people now that are, you know, maybe listening to this podcast, they're, they're moving in that direction. They're getting some new piece of equipment that they've never used before. What are some specific things we can communicate to them to, to prepare for the process? Because I know, I mean, when I got my presses installed, you know, years ago, um, it was daunting. It's a lot. It's a lot yeah. to take in. You know, you've got your your air, your, you know, did I pick the right compressor? Did I pick the right chiller? I've got to get this electricity ran. You know, I've never dealt with three phase power before until I bought, you know, my first auto and, and, you know, you have forklifts to think. I mean, there's all these things that you have to think about and um, it is a lot to communicate. I mean, yeah. you know, even in this situation where, you've got a used piece of equipment going out, you know, setting those expecta expectations the right way. It's a lot because not only do we have to communicate that, we also need to communicate all these other things that I just kind of rambled off. Yeah, so. and I think part of that too, Ross, is I think we need to really um, understand that the only trucks that some of these guys going from manuals to, to autos have seen in their life are UPS and FedEx trucks. They're getting boxes of t-shirts or they're getting printing supplies. When you're dealing with a press, you're getting a motor freight truck that's going to pull up and it's going to take generally a forklift of which, how do we run a forklift? Where do we find that? How does that work? Um, I don't know how to drive a forklift. Um, and just those logistics are scary. And so we just really have to be cognizant of that and to be able to walk people through and to, and to help them understand that, you know, this is how it will work, get this. And we try to try to be diligent on that. Um, some people take more handholding than others, which is fine. Um, we just need to, we understand that that's a big process. So um, just the logistics of getting your press can be really scary. And I'll let Buck talk about just even like the air and the power and that sort of thing, because that's something different, too, because it's it's uh, it's a lot of power that you're going to need. to be And able to run these be things. before Buck answers that, I mean, I know one thing is logistics. Oh, logistics. Yeah. It's one of our most favorite things. And, you know, dealing with freight companies is a lot different than UPS. I mean, we're all used to you know, Amazon showing up or, or, you know, UPS, we're even just talking about our homes and, 
you know, you can hop online, you put in a tracking number. It's like, okay, on truck for delivery. If there's a problem, you know, there's a number to call, et cetera. And I mean, you usually get something the next day. You know, with freight, it's a lot different because you've got different types of freight, FTL, LTL. You've got LTL trucks that aren't only delivering, you know, the rock press to you, but they might have a oven in that same truck that's going to someone's home. Yeah, and, and I can explain that a little yeah. bit too. I mean, when you're going LTL, which is less than truckload, generally most of the smaller presses, you're getting two pallets. Um, they're going to go less than truckload. So that truck is going from our facility where that press is, and it's going to that trucker's hub, nearest hub. It's getting separated out, all the freight they picked up, getting separated out, going into a different trailer, going to their next destination and doing the same thing over and over again. So when you get into winter, where you get into weather, you get into, you know, maybe that trailer is going to sit an extra day because they didn't have a full trailer to move it. Um, we're on that. So they're general timelines and we try to try to make sure that they're going to call out and get that information to you when they're going to deliver it. Uh, we do the best we can to make that communication happen and follow that across. Um, but again, you're dealing with things that are unknowns and where they're at, they don't even know. They try to give you best case. So um, generally, it's even better to plan that it hits the hits the facility and sits a day, which doesn't cost you anything. And then we rent the truck and get it at the forklifts and whatnot to get it out to you. But as that happens, feel free to call us and track that along the way. And uh, we'll certainly help that and check into the freight delivery as well. Awesome. Thanks for that. And then Buck, let's uh, move back over to you on electrical and air and just sort of, you know, some things that people could start to think about ahead of time, maybe talk a little bit about our provisioning document that goes out and what what that means and what people should look for so they uh, can better equip themselves for the uh, for the journey. Yeah, I, I think you said it really well um, with, you know, there's there's so much that's going in, into purchasing this equipment. You know, there's the initial sale, you're super excited, and then we send you this provisioning document that says, okay, well, now you need this much power, you need this much air. It's like, well, I didn't provision to have to spend all this extra money, but now I need to. So knowing that it's not just the price of the equipment, you are going to have to buy a really good compressor and chiller. You're going to have to run power. You might even have to upgrade your power from single phase to three phase. So getting that information before I say you, you pull the trigger on that sales order, we can get you that information so you know what your facility has for power rather than you getting the equipment being like, oh, great. Well, now I need to upgrade my panel. This is going to cost me $10,000. I didn't expect this. Expect you are going to have to spend money on running power and air. We will be here to support you. The, the air side is very easy to hook up power. You need to have a certified electrician which the rock technicians are not certified electricians, okay? Um, we try to help you out as much as possible to get you up and running to save you a little bit of money, but your certified electrician needs to run all of the wires, the conduit, everything, and then as soon as the equipment gets there, they have to run it through the machine with our help and make the final connection, and then we test the power, make sure that it's good. So that is, I would say... Um, you know, talking with owners that bought the equipment and then they're like, man, I just didn't think that I was going to end up having to spend 10,000 extra dollars. It's like, well, just remember. So that's at the sales process. At the beginning, you should be thinking about this versus just the overall cost of the equipment. And that's some simple things too, like having the right hoses ready. Yeah. I mean, I remember I got, uh, you know, my unit installed and I, I didn't actually think about having like all these extra costs of, you know, running airlines, right? And the right. plumber, what was it a plumber? It was the air compressor person, but you can have plumbers do this as well, but came out and gave me this quote. And I mean, my eyes, right? Just like opened up because I wanted, I didn't want PVC. I wanted black pipe. I wanted, you know, I wanted the best of the best and, you know, I had all this extra money. So he ended up installing all this stuff and it was great. And, you know, the press shows up. I, of course, didn't have forklifts. Luckily, I had nice neighbors. Um, yeah, I needed two of them actually to get 
to get my equipment off of the truck. I get it in, the tech shows up and he's like, you know, he gets everything put together. He's like, where's your hoses to run off the bib from the wall? Cause I had the air bib on the wall, you know, presses over here. And I'm like, what do you mean hose? What hose? And, um, you know, he was great, you know, just, just like our techs are. And it's like, got on his phone, Googled the nearest hose man, got his pen and paper, wrote down exactly, you know, what, what I needed to get. He hung out. I brought him back lunch because <laughs> I felt bad. And, uh, you know, I booked it to, to this place and had to pick up all these extra hoses, but you know, the journey, you know, a lot of times we think that, you know, okay, I bought it, you know, my journey is over, but this journey can continue and continue and continue. And I was one of those unprepared people. Yeah. So, um, totally and, makes sense. And through this process too, you'll work with our project manager, Micah Croson, and he's going to ask you for pictures. And so I just want to make sure, you know, don't take offense um, that we don't trust you. Um, what we're doing is we're just double checking to make sure that you're prepared because it's a lot more costly if we come in and show up for an install and then your power is not correct. Um, and then we have tech has to leave and he's got to come back. It's just a lot of downtime that you don't know. You're excited. Everything's going to get set up. So our pictures are just a way of double checking just to make sure that the facility and you've understood things correctly and it gives us still an opportunity to make those changes and adjustments that are going to cost you um, more money down the way. Yeah. And I think too, it's, it's getting mentally prepared for a bumpy road. I, I don't know if there's such Sammy, mean, we've got some, I guess, installs that I'd say are quote perfect in quote, but I'm sure even that perfect install, you know, our, our partner didn't have the right hose or they didn't have this, or there had to be an adjustment on the electric line. So, you know, make sure, you know, if you're listening to this, you know, be flexible, understand that, you know, perfection in this was so many people and different companies involved, starting from, you know, us using a freight company to deliver all the way through to, you know, our, our partner hiring an electrician to come out and, and do the work. I mean, there's so many parties involved in getting a piece of machinery in, get it fired up, get it running that, you know, you just have to be prepared, you know, and understanding through the process as frustrating as sometimes it, it definitely can be because it's, it's an unknown and, you know, all you want to do is turn it on and uh, start making a lot more money than you made before, which is, is definitely the goal. So um, just important to note, and we're definitely, you know, not perfect and and never would claim to be. Um, but we definitely, you know, are striving uh, to get better all the time and learning from from all of our experiences. Um, so just to, yeah, I want to you touched on a little bit about the installation agreement. And when that gets sent out to you, um, a lot of people you'll look at it, it's going to be an electronic document and you're going to read that over. And Hopefully. a lot of people can, some of us, right. Some of those people, there's a lot of important information, but we'll just fill it out and send it back. And that's where we can get in trouble because the press, there's power out there, voltage that is too high for the press. And that's where we can get into trouble. And that's where our documents are going to help you to be able to protect yourself from your electrician. And so that, you know, so that your press is not going to, going to have an issue by blowing out something because your power was too high. Um, mm -hmm. And we can help along that way. It's better to catch that up front than it is when we're on site. So Yeah. And des definitely ask uh, the sales rep that you're working with in that sales process. What power do I need? What air do I need? They'll connect with Buck or someone else on our team, get all that information ahead of the game. Um, so you're that much, you know, further in front. And I mean, we've done floor plans for shops, layouts for shops. So any of that stuff that you need help with, we're here um, to do all that. All you have to do is ask. So definitely ask because it's just extra benefit for you um, making this process go a lot more smoothly. Um, with that said, we're going to take our next commercial break and we will be right back. 
To honor today's female leaders, Screen Printing Magazine is looking for six accomplished women who through their careers, industry involvement, and philanthropic roles have sparked innovation, spurred business growth, improved their communities, and enhanced the screen printing industry. Nominees must hold a leadership position at a company that produces screen printing as its primary function. Honorees will appear in the Screen Printing Magazine October and November 2020 issue. To nominate the rocking women screen printing in your life, please visit screenweb.com slash womenprint no later than August 4th, 2020. I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop, where we discuss all things screen printing. Today's episode features the topics of the buck starts here and service, general tips, FIR requests, and technical advice for screen printers. And we are joined by our special guests, Mr. Buck Primo and Mr. Mark Showman, both of Rock US. Alongside of me here, we've got Mr. Merrill Caps. Thank you all. And uh, let's dive back in. So... Well, we want to understand where and how our listeners can receive proper training for operating and self-servicing their equipment. So, you know, I I think that this really goes to we were on site. So what does that look like when we're on site? We're doing an install. What tools, resources, what are we giving them? What do they need, need to pay attention to? And then, you know, on top of that, who from their business should be involved in in that training in that setup uh, to ensure you know best success with with our equipment? I would say that anybody that you think might be operating that equipment, um, the the problem that I've I've seen in the past is, um, you know, you've got your press operators. They were there. They got all the training. They know how to run the machine. He calls in sick. Now we only. We, the only person that knows how to operate it, they're gone. So now the, the owner of the shop is having to learn how to use this piece of equipment that he didn't take the time out to go through the training during the install. So now I'm on the phone, you know, trying to explain how to print a t-shirt. So I feel like making sure that you have your main screen printer as well as a backup of some sort. So if somebody calls in sick or somebody quits, you're not dead in the water and you're not having to learn how to use a machine over the phone. So I would say anybody that um, could possibly be on that equipment, we'll train everybody. Um, even if you have two shifts, we'll try to break it up to where we'll train the first shift in the morning and then night shift comes in, we'll train the night shift. So everybody knows how to operate that piece of equipment. But what we've done is we've also recorded videos that tell you, it's basically the training that I would give you on the press we have a video, so like uh, print arm, all the controls, there's a video specifically for that. There's a video going over the main display. There's a video that goes over how to set up multi-print. So really all of the training that we're giving you on site, we have videos that are exactly that. And they're broken up into segments of, you know, uh, adjusting squeegee angle or whatever question you might have. So that's a really, really good resource. If you need to brush up or say, you know, three, four months down the road, uh, you you just want a refresher. You could give us a call and I could be like, hey, you, you haven't even touched your squeegee angle. You guys need to be adjusting this every single, you know, not say every single job, but, you know, I, I try to tell them this isn't just set it and forget it. Let's try to, you know, say you're top white, let's move that angle to a, a five degree angle or, you know, back off the pressure or whatever. It, it's not set and forget. Let's mess around with this and do a couple of test prints to figure out how we can get the best result that we're going for. I think you kind of hit an important topic too, you know, for all of our single or, or dual auto shops. Uh, I personally would highly recommend that every owner of those businesses be involved in that training because you never know, you know, I mean, look at what's happening right now with, with COVID. Um, you have to let go of people, you know, you got to be nimble. You've got to be able to, to adjust with what's happening in our economy and other things. Obviously, hopefully we don't have a, another pandemic, but we don't control those things. And if you don't know how to operate that machine, um, you know, you're going to have to pay. And typically speaking, if you're the only one having to operate that machine, you probably don't want to take money out of your pocket to pay to have someone come back to, to train you. So, you know, I've seen far too often, you know, owners kind of skip out on, on that training 
and, you know, they do let someone go or something does happen or people get sick or whatever the case may be. And, you know, they've got jobs due and, um, you know, you, you've got to know, and it, it's not complicated to get to the point where you can press a few buttons and, and, and print. Um, but it can look foreign if you've never seen it before. Um, and you're trying to learn for the first time, um, especially when you're in a stress situation, yeah. um, it makes it that much more difficult. So, you know, to all you owners out there, definitely, if, if we're coming on site to do training, be a part of it. I mean, it's, it's, if anything you're learning, so if you need to train someone else that starts with you or whatever the case may be, um, you, you know what you're doing. Um, you know, and in terms of, of ongoing training or additional training, you know, I want all our listeners to know we are always available for that. So if you need, you know, us to come back out, I mean, there is a fee associated with it. Um, but, you know, we've got a great team of people here. We've got, got probably 100 plus years of screen printing experience combined. Um, all of, I, I want to say probably at least half of our team has owned a business and owned a business in this space. Um, some of us for quite some time, I know Mark owned a business for 30 years. I owned one for 12, a couple of our, our sales team have both owned yeah. businesses in the space. So there's a wealth of knowledge and there's always someone available to come out and train you just depending on what, what it is you're needing to be trained on, whether it be the press or, you know, dark room or, or whatever the case may be in, in screen printing. So don't hesitate to ask that either. If it's something that, that you are needing to brush up on or, or needing additional training. And I, and I think it's important too to re recognize training. So our tech is going to come in and he's going to meet with you before he starts doing anything. It's going to set the expectations for you. Going to what's happening. He's going to give you updates daily before he leaves. So he really needs who's the point person who he's going to talk to, get that all set up. And he's going to let you know prior to, hey, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be ready for training at this time, whatever. And that's going to be important to have your individuals ready at that time. And so I know a lot of times we're going in, this is adding another press, and then there's jobs to be run and stuff. But knowing ahead of time that we are coming in, that's when you may want to push a little bit do a little overtime, get some of those jobs out of the way, save a couple for the press itself, but get the majority so they can focus on, on learning this piece of equipment because it is your number one employee. It beats you to work every single day. And when you turn the lights on, it's, you flip that switch, it's smiling at you, and it's going to run. It's not going to talk back to you. And um, it is an easy piece of equipment to operate. We have shops that actually are taking their office workers and running them through it because that comes that day when that press operator is sick and you have deadlines to meet and that those secretaries are not secretaries, but those office workers can come on out and they can help. Uh, they can run that press fairly easily. So um, I really highly recommend that. Absolutely. So, regarding those videos, Buck, are those videos that you send out? I mean, I know we're we're building our library, but in the meantime, uh, until we can get on location and get in. Yeah, we could production again. totally send them out or we could also, you know, if you have a question, um, the, the shop that I office out of, they've got a press, they've got a dryer, uh, they've got a PRU, flashes, all that stuff. So we could even do a FaceTime to where I'm showing you what you need to be looking at. Um, so we can work through it a lot faster. FaceTime works really, really well on any of these issues that, that come up or even just general questions. Mm -hmm. um, if we can't solve it through a phone call or a text and you're not understanding it, we get on FaceTime or WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, Messenger, video. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that we can FaceTime um, and be able to solve it so much quicker because, you know, I'm saying one thing, you're seeing another thing, but once that video starts, it, it's so much easier. It goes so much quicker. So Excellent. being able yeah. to do that, it's a huge resource for us. And a lot of time, you know, it feels like you're taking a test because <laughs> it's so much information, you know, and you show up to the test. So the tech leaves, it's like you showing up to the test and your mind goes blank. <laughs> you come in the next morning no text there to, to remind you of what to do. And so that could be frightening. Pick up the phone and call. Don't yeah. spend time messing around. We'll take care of you. We'll get you back on track and you'll be good to go. Yeah, I think one more important thing to note when it comes to training, um, you know, 
it's something generally you purchase, you know, when you're buying your, your piece of equipment, whatever kind of a piece of equipment it is, be honest with what you know. And, and the reason I say that to our listeners is, you know, we have lots of different techs that go do installs. Some of, some of them are, you know, more machine focused. All of our techs know our machines in and out, but I, more my point is, is some of them are, are much more just solely machine focused. They can train you on the machine all day long, but if you don't know how to print, i.e., you know, you're just now getting into screen printing, you don't have a lot of darkroom experience, you don't have a lot of experience burning screens and, you know, even doing artwork, we do have technicians that were screen printers. And so if you're honest with us in the sales process, it helps understand who we need to send to do your install based on your skill level. And, you know, a lot of times we found that, yeah, I don't want to say that people are dishonest, but people don't know. And it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of I've watched some videos. I know screen printing. So they're like, yeah, I'll just take the the day mm -hmm. of screen printing training. We show up and, you know, there aren't screens burned. There isn't anything ready because they they don't know how to do it. And it's not their fault. That's OK. It's just a matter of like being honest with yourself and, and what your skill level is. So we make sure a you're getting enough days. And B, we're sending the right person for your needs because um, we do installs for shops that have been in business for, you know, 35, 40 years. And no, they don't need to know how to screen print. They need to know how to operate that machine. And we do startup companies that are, that are fresh out of the gate. And so when we're building our schedule, getting our installers ready to go out, you know, week by week, we're scheduling based on what's needed from, from our partners and our new, new consumers of the product. So... We want to make sure that, you know, you're honest with yourself, honest with what you need so we can give you the best service while we're there. Absolutely. And you're also going to find out, especially when you're going from manual to automatic, it's a different process on thinking, how are we separating this um, artwork? Uh, remember on a, on, a, on a manual, the top moves and the bottom moves. On the auto, just the bottom moves, just the plat, just the shirt is moving around. So you don't have as much flexibility as you do on a manual. So you want to set your jobs up and it's just a different thinking process. And our goal is to get you to print, put a shirt on and take it off and not send that thing around twice or three times. So, which if you don't separate things correctly, those are the issues that you're going to have and it's just going to cost you time. So. Absolutely. No, it is a crazy process. I, you know, I went to school for this and actually degree in fine art emphasis on printmaking. And so I started screen printing on paper. Granted, in college, we called it serigraphy because we're fancy like that. But, you know, we did all the screen printing on paper. So when I decided, hey, I'm going to start this T-shirt printing business. I, I started with a manual and I thought I just knew everything. Right. And uh, did I know what a white underbase was? <laughs> no clue. So, you know, you get on press, I'm like, you know, I thought I'm good. It's the same thing going from manual to auto. When I went from that manual to auto, I had finally gotten my process dialed in on the manual. And I'm like, you know, I know what's going on. And I got on the auto and it was like, wait, why doesn't this look as good? I just paid, you know, $80,000 for this piece of equipment. And it is because things change. And so, you know, it's just important to note that, that a lot changes from step to step to step. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on here. How do you and Buck define a stellar service experience? What does that look like? Stellar service experience. Um, that is, so normally, uh, generally when, when a sale is done, you're going to start with a warm call, what we call a warm call. So that's going to meet, you're going to meet our project manager, Micah. He's going to understand your shop. He's new to it. He's going to rediscover kind of why you bought the machine, what your needs are, and then he's going to explain to you your power needs, your everything we've talked about in here, and it's going to be an overload of information. And so you're going to want to sit back, read the material he has, and then feel free to call back and set up another appointment if you want to. That's what I would do, and I'd, I'd go back over it and disseminate just exactly what you have to make sure that is clear. Um, but stellar one is obviously is we have the equipment, 
you have everything, you complete your, your instructions on power and everything's good to go and air, you got your compressor, everything's set up. We come in, it gets shipped, everything looks great, comes out of the crate, he shows up, puts you all up, gets everything fixed up, ready to go, it's all installed. You print, you learn it, he leaves, everything's looking great. That's a stellar, that's the top one. But then along the way, you know, we're gonna have some bumps and where a stellar one really goes into is understanding that and us explaining to you what's going on and helping you along the way um, and keeping you appraised of, of how, what we're gonna be doing, why we're gonna be doing it. And if we have to take extra time, we will not leave your facility because something has gone wrong. Something may go wrong. And I think we could still have a stellar um, install. Um, we're going to remain on site and make sure that before we leave, you're up and running and, and learned on this machine. Fair enough. Uh, that's awesome. Buck, do you have anything to add to that? Before yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, our, our main focus for, you know, the Rock US team is to make sure that you are completely happy with everything. We're going to do everything that we need to do. Say the machine's damaged or whatever. I say we always make it right. It might not be right at that time, but just give us a little bit of time and we will make sure that it's 100% right, that you are happy, regardless of what happens uh, before. Uh, from this point on, we will make sure, you know, once the tech shows up, um, it's like Christmas. Yes, maybe there's some damage or whatever, but we will make sure that that is right. Our technicians, that is their focus is to get that machine operating, the, you know, the way that it should get you the training. And when we leave your shop, you should know, you know, how to operate it, how to do the maintenance or just, just everything and feeling comfortable. I would say that's, that's success. And then after the install, if I don't hear from you, I would say that's success. If I know your name and your numbers programmed in my phone, then maybe we've got some, some issues, but still, I, I would say that, you know, my main focus day and night. I mean, I start some phone calls are at 6 a.m. I'll have phone calls till 10. I, I tell people it's 24 seven, like I am available. Um, sucks for a personal life, but that is what I chose. Um, I, I have gotten in the car from getting a phone call an hour later, I am in the car driving 15 hours to fix an issue. that took me 10 minutes to fix and turning around and driving the 15 hours home. So Nothing is too small to where we will, uh, you know, we our, our main priority is to not have the equipment down. And if we have to do that, we will do that. That's fantastic. And you might surf on the way home, it looks like, from, from behind <laughs> you there. Yeah, any of you uh, people that have shops that are near surf, I'm sure your machine needs a technician to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do have a, a trip planned. It's going to be probably a week and a half out in Hawaii where I'm going to hit all of our customers, make sure that they're good. Um, you know, it, just because it costs a lot to get over there, it takes a lot of time. Hit all you guys. It's coming soon. Um, I just have a, a digital machine that I've got to get installed here soon. Nice. Yes. Well, I kind of want to jump ahead one question ahead because you kind of brought it up here, but uh, is there anything else that we at Rock US do differently um, from other manufacturers when it comes to service that you know? Um, I mean, our service hours, like they, they don't stop. You know, mm -hmm. I know some other manufacturers, it's, you know, nine to five. If you're lucky, it might be nine to three thirty. Um, if, if I see a case that comes through, you know, you guys submitted a ticket. I get a text message saying that a case is created. I will call you um, 9.30 at night, if that's when you're printing, to solve that case. I'll call you Sunday night. I, I'm, anytime that you guys are working, if I'm available and I'm in service, if not, we've got technicians that are on the East Coast. We've got technicians that are on the West Coast. We're covered in the all time zones. So, um, you know, we, it, I would say that our, our uh, step above is being able to communicate throughout the day. You know, there's, there's no time that That's we great. will stop communicating with you. I think another big points, um, are warranty. Do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? Cause I know that is a yeah. place that definitely sets us, uh, apart. 
and our word to you is, is we like to call it squeegee to squeegee, but it's essentially is what it is. It's, it's three years on the press and it's parts, labor and travel, which is untouched in the industry. And the reason why, big reason why we're able to do that is because the travel isn't really that necessary. Your press, like we talked about, you maintain your press, you have your weekly cleanup, you do everything. We don't hear from you. Um, and so that's really the big point. But that means, like Buck said, it's 24-7. Um, a lot of people are running nights, you're running weekends because you have to have that job. Uh, done that you just got on Friday and they need it Saturday night for some event and you said yes because that's what we do in this industry we say yes and then we go what were we thinking <laughs> but there's always a time when we do get that done but that's when things happen right when we accept those jobs that's when things really happen and so we want to be available there for you as well and I mean I know Buck early on he he came out uh, there's a press down in New York he flew out to, to Washington to get a part off a of press we had here uh, on Friday. It went down on Friday. He flew out, um, got the part, flew over to New York, got it up and running, and was back in Colorado Springs. Right. And the guy didn't miss a day running. And that's our that's what we want to try to do. It doesn't always happen that way. That's really what our aim is because you bought it to be running, and that's what we want to make sure that you're running. Absolutely. We'll kind of uh, do a, a, a just a key takeaway thought um, and then, you know, any last comments that you guys have to our listeners. But um, what are some types of issues when self-service is sufficient and when and, and what are some key examples of the most appropriate times to submit service requests? So I guess the question really is like, when should I pop on YouTube and take a look at a video and when should I definitely you know, either pick up the phone or, well, hopefully we just told everyone submit a service request, but submit a service request. I think you just automatically submit a service request because it could take you, you know, a half hour or something to try to figure out through a video, something that you submit a request in a matter of minutes, we're calling you and we can get that solved within say a total of five minutes versus you trying to, you know, sift through all this information or, you know, a, a lot of, I, I see a lot of customers that will get on our rock support uh, Facebook page and rather than doing an FIR, they're asking the community, Hey, have you seen this? Hey, how do I fix this? When, if they were to just submit a ticket, we will call you, we'll be able to get it fixed. We'll send you the parts that we need. A lot of the, I would say the issues that we see on our machine are able to be diagnosed over the phone and um, solved with, you know, I know you guys don't want to take time out, like, you know, use a screwdriver and Allen key to fix this or that, but I could really fix your machine in a matter of minutes versus, okay, well, your machine's down. You don't want to touch it. Um, okay. Well now we have to schedule a technician. We'll, you know, try to fly out that next day. We get to the shop. So you could be down almost a full day versus if you were to work with me over the phone, I can get you up and running. I have complete faith in that. Um, that's why we have the three-year warranty. We, we know this equipment. We have um, full belief in it, that it, it is superior. Like it, that is, that is the reason why we offer that three-year. So um, in your, normally when you buy your, your press or your dryer, it comes with a few spare parts. So say a sensor goes out, you go to your spare parts box or fuses, same thing. You go to your spare parts box, we're able to work back and forth and get you back up and running. So it's, you know, it, it comes with tools. It, it's great. So um, I would say just submit a ticket. Um, you can post on Facebook, but submit that ticket and you're going to get a response time um, within minutes versus you might be able to get the solution on the Facebook page. I try to check it. I'm not big on Facebook, but once in a while, I'll get on the Rock Owners Facebook page to make sure that you guys are getting the correct information because I've gone on there and actually seen people recommending the wrong thing. So that's why I say submit the ticket so I can give you the right advice and we can get you back up and running. Awesome. You Absolutely. Have any last Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, I had Buck laughing yesterday. We had a local customer who purchased a gas dryer 
and had it fired up uh, yesterday morning. I uh, took a late lunch and put it on standby, came back and it wouldn't fire up for him. And uh, I was the only buddy person around. I called Buck up, said, hey, I got to be at the shop in the morning. Can you walk me through what's going on? And he started laughing. <laughs> and uh, we talked this morning and within what, 15 minutes, we yeah. have the dryer up and running and uh, it's going strong. So um, he's our team is extremely well versed at being patient and working with you over the phone. He's got pictures, he's got whatever he sent me pictures, said, no, you're looking for this part here. And I was able to do it. It was a great experience for me because he was leading a blind person through something. And like I said, we were dialed in 15 minutes. So yeah. if, if Mark can fix the machine, <laughs> fix the machine, okay. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming in and, uh, having uh, this time with us and uh, talking about uh, service and FIRs. It seems like the rule of thumb here, I mean, my big takeaway is submit a ticket. Yeah, submit. <laughs> Hashtag submit a ticket. Um, can you guys say how people can find you if they need to get in touch with you? Yeah, they can. Uh, you can email me at mshoman, S-H-O-M-A-N, at rock.us uh, or call the... Um, Eight seven rocket now number that comes directly to me, and um, I can facilitate from there. So uh, those are the two easiest ways. Great. Yeah, for me it's very easy. Buck at rock.us. That's my email address. I would say majority of you people have my cell phone number, <laughs> and if not, um, I I give it out. I'm not. This is what I want you guys to know is we want to document these cases, okay? We want to know what's going on with your equipment so we can go back to the manufacturer and be like, hey, we're seeing this trend or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to document it. I would say if you document it and you're not getting a call back, say, five, 10 minutes or time's dragging on, call me. Because what I'll do is I might be busy. I might be installing a machine or training a customer. I'll be able to solve your, your ticket. And then I can go back to somebody that's in the office and be like, hey, there's this ticket that was opened. Can you close it? So um, most of you have my cell phone number. If you don't, you probably will. Um, but I hope to not hear from you because that means that your machine is running and uh, we can just drink a beer when I see you at a trade show. There we go. So again, just to reiterate to everyone, if you've got a support ticket, that's rock.us. Go to the support tab, scroll down to repair ticket, parentheses, FIR. Uh, there'll be a form that shows up. And Buck, do you want to speak a little bit about that form? I know there's some specifics yeah, that we need. It's pretty self-explanatory. One um, main thing that we need to know is there's a serial number on your equipment. On the presses, it's right on the base of the machine next to the air regulator. On the flashes, it'll be somewhere on the hood or the frame. On the dryers, it's on the left-hand side of the electrical cabinet. On the folding lines, it's to the left of where you load the shirt. Um, on the pack unit, it's right next to the electrical cabinet just below the display. Um, so there's a number of places, but um, if not, if you can't find the serial number, just submit. I would say that the main, the most important thing is making sure that you put who we're supposed to contact, the name and number versus what's going to show up as your uh, default number, because that might be somebody that used to work at the company and now they don't, or say that person's out sick or whatever. So make sure you put in who we're supposed to talk to on the issue and what their number is so we can get um, in contact with them as quickly as possible. Thanks to our special guest, tech team leader Buck Primo and APG director Mark Showman of Rock US for participating today. As always, thank you for spending time with us this week. Tune in next week or at your convenience on wherever you listen to your podcast by searching Rock Shop Talk. That's R O Q Shop Talk. On our next show, we'll feature the Rock Eco and the power of automation for screen printers. If you'd like to join the live Zoom hangout or even request to be on the show, please visit rock.us forward slash rock shop talk. That's R-O-Q dot U-S forward slash R-O-Q shop talk. 
If you found today's episode helpful, the greatest accolade we could ask for is for you to recommend it to a friend who you think might find it helpful as well. Here to subscribe on social media. Until next time, rockers, press onward.